Uh, well, we might make a start. Yeah. So, thank you everyone for coming along tonight. The idea, well, the idea for this, and I guess, like all good things, came out of a run. Uh, so, you know, you get to a certain age and you start feeling the symptoms and you start feeling <coughs> a bit crap and you tend to talk to the people that you're out running with, don't you? And so one day uh, Michelle and I were out on a run and I was having a whinge about how I was not sleeping very well anymore and waking constantly in the night, to which Michelle lamented, yeah, it's really tough and, you know, there's not a lot of information out there about menopause. And I guess there was both a level of frustration from both of us and then we sort of took that to a wider group of friends and we started to realise that people in our age group were all going through the same thing. We're all, you know, sleeping like shit, our joints ache. We walk into a room and go, well, why was I here again? Um, and that it doesn't have to be a horrible experience. There are things that you can do. There are medical interventions, there are food interventions, there are all sorts of things. And that's where we then, Michelle, at one of our committee me meetings actually turned around and said, I'd really like to look for someone who can come and talk to us about this. Because really our demographic, we've got quite a lot of runners who are in this age group being affected by perimenopause, menopause, technically, post-menopause. <laughs> um, and surprisingly enough, no, actually it's not surprising. There are very, very few people who have information in this space. We went to AV first um, and they went, oh, That'd be a great idea but they didn't have anyone who could come and talk to us um, so I tasked we tasked Michelle with actually going out and finding somebody and she rang around and did the whole Jean Hales and all of those people and they didn't have people either it's crazy there's so many They've of us in this age group but not correct but no one yeah. to talk to us so Michelle then come across Arby and look at we found someone to come and talk to us somebody who actually understands because she's a runner too I was going to say, um, I actually know her through Strava, <laughs> didn't yeah. know that she's a GP, so just Googling people who could talk to us, I know that name. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. so um, I will stop talking now, but I'd just like to introduce Dr Harvey Charlton and say thank you in advance for coming and talking to us tonight, and I'll get out of the way and let you go. Thank you. So a few years ago, I wanted to see where Michelle runs because I wanted to go through where she runs. That's how I followed her. And I asked where, if I can follow her Strava so I can go through the Yarra Bends and Warren Dyke. That's how we met. So um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we gather to meet today and pay my respect to the elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people we stay to, we, we, people who's here today. So that's the first thing. The next thing is, um, this is not individual medical advice. I am a doctor, but this is not individual, so don't treat it as medical advice. Go and see your own doctor for your own advice. Then um, I just want to share a, a story that my very dear friend shared with me when she knew that I was doing this talk. She said um, she's about our age, about 50-ish, and she thought she was going through menopause. She was going, having hot flushes at night and she couldn't sleep. She was waking up multiple times at night. And then, but her period was still coming. And then all of a sudden she um, asked her husband, oh, what have you been doing with the electric blanket? <laughs> <laughs> it turns out that he forgot to turn off the electric blanket every night. So <laughs> it wasn't actually menopause after all. It was actually <laughs> him that turning off the electric blanket. Yeah. So, um, so that, that's a lesson that um, we should just be careful of other causes other than menopause. <laughs> so, um, first of all, this slides are from the Jean House Foundation. So I borrowed the file, but I've added a few things to my uh, opinion and my learning. So just to introduce myself, I'm Avi Charlton. I'm a Westerfoldian, so I've been with the Westerfoldians for about seven years. Uh, Facebook just flashed back that I, it was my seven-year parkrun anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a GP for much longer than that. I've been working in Montana for about 16 years. 
So the story with me is um, I first become a GP, then I had my kids and the kids grew up and I wanted to lose the excess fat and weight that I had from having the kids. So um, uh, one day I joined the gym. I did about three times a week going to the gym. After a couple of months, nothing happened, no weight change and I felt the same. So I took up couch to 5k run and then I started running which probably is a very similar story to all of you. And then uh, a few years ago, I did an um, uh, eight-week body transformation challenge with the gym. And uh, the trainer prescribed certain macros. I had to eat so much protein, so much fat, so much carbs, and I had to put it on a scale to weigh it. And um, I lost about four kilos, which was all that I wanted to lose, and I felt fantastic, sleep better. And uh, that diet is um, a low-carb diet. So then I researched it all and I keep learning but um, uh, and I keep running, I run four times a week. Over here is um, my home which I set up as a home gym through lo lockdown. Mm. I did two marathons in total. 2019 I did Melbourne Marathon at 4 hours 16. Last year I didn't do as good so <laughs> yeah. I'm also a mum, I've got two kids, they are 13 and 10. So that's a bit of information about me, that's uh, Westerfoldians at the Run for the Fireys, we're all mm -hmm. do a healthy competition, hopefully we can do it again this year. Mm -hmm. So this is the Gene Howe slides, by the end of the presentation we hope you will understand what menopause is, we should celebrate it, it's normal. What's the, what's the alternative of menopause? Is death. So we're all going through normal change of life and um, hopefully by the end you should know how to uh, manage your symptoms and take care of your health during and after the menopause and be aware of the importance of maintaining good health during midlife. Um, this is just their slide to uh, talk about an inclusive approach to the topic of women's health, um, a bit of gender diversity, diversity and um, we appreciate that not all people going through menopause are women. That's their slide. So about menopause. So menopause is the final menstrual period, so it's defined as the last period. Usually we start off with perimenopause or first, so perimenopause is when the period goes up and down, your hormones go up and down, and then finally there hits to a stage when at menopause there's no more periods. The definition of menopause is no period for 12 months. So it's just a quite an arbitrary definition. Um, it's when it's a natural process and when the ovaries run out of eggs. You can have other, other causes of menopause through chemotherapy or radiotherapy or hysterectomy um, with the removal of ovaries, so that can cause an artificial menopause. Um, the hormones makes your, is a, a chemical messengers in your body, carries all the um, uh, chemicals around and delivers the messages. The main thing is the estrogen, progesterone and testosterone. So the estrogen is the main hormone that gets depleted during menopause. A lot of the symptoms is because of the estrogen deficiency. So usually the average is about 51, is when people, when women go through menopause. It can range from between 45 to 55, but most people go through at 51. Some people go through menopause too early. Uh, sometimes if it's before 40, it's premature menopause. Um, these people really should seek help and they really should see an endocrinologist because it's really way too early to have menopause. If they go, if they lose the hormones too early, they can have risk of uh, increased cardiovascular health, heart disease, osteoporosis. They really need to have extra hormones to help them through because they lose the protection of the hormones. So early menopause is um, between 40 and 45. Some of the menopausal symptoms can be more severe. Um, so these premature menopause, they really should have treatment 
to ease the symptoms and reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, dementia. So if you're under 45 and you go through menopause, you really should see your doctor. Um, the GP ideally should refer you to an endocrinologist and uh, get more testing, see what's happening with your hormones. So the stages of the menopause, as I said, perimenopausal is the leading up, so you're running out of eggs. Then there's menopause, when there's no more eggs. And then after 12 months, after the last period is postmenopause, when you go into uh, your next stage in life. There's no definitive test according to Jean Hales. Um, it's mainly a symptomatic diagnosis. So you go to a doctor, you talk about symptoms. Usually it's about your periods. So if your period's all over the place, then it can be menopause. If you're going, if you're taking the pill, you're probably not going through menopause because you're taking hormones. Um, there's no definite test. Some there are blood tests and saliva tests available, um, but there are, according to Gene Hales, they're not reliable. I do sometimes do them, but um, usually it's according to your symptoms. So hot flushes, I've got symptoms later. So hot flushes, <coughs> nut sweats, dry vagina, migraines, aches and pains, sleep disturbance, dirty problems, central weight gain, crawling or itchy skin. Some people feel like they have... Um, insects crawling under the skin, so that's uh, another symptom of menopause. So again, perimenopause is the, when it's the leading up to menopause. Your period can go all over the place, every two weeks, every two months, every six months, and then it'll come again every two weeks. Sometimes it can last for two weeks, sometimes it lasts for four weeks, and then it goes all over the place. We can get med medications to stop the period because it's annoying bleed for two weeks non-stop. It can be quite heavy, it can be quite late. It's this, the period of going up and down with the hormones. Some people can have emotional symptoms, you can be anxious, irritable, mood swings, trouble concentrating, and uh, reduce interest in sex. 20% of women have no symptoms, so that's fantastic. 61% have mild to moderate, 20% of women can have quite severe symptoms. So how do we manage it? So I like to talk about lifestyle before medication. Lifestyle, so there's options, lifestyle, menopause, hormone therapy. So it used to be called HRT, hormone replacement therapy. Because of the scare of the Women's Health Initiative a few years ago, we like the change of the name to MHT rather than <coughs> HRT. It's pretty much the same thing. Um, there are other non-hormonal treatments. You can have a blood pressure tablet. You can have a antidepressant. Are all other options that the doctor can prescribe? Um, if it's mainly your vaginal dryness, there are estrogen suppositories or cream that can help with just that symptom. Um, there are herbs as well that can help with uh, menopausal symptoms. Um, there are bioidentical hormones. Jean Health Foundation doesn't recommend it. Sorry, I'll just get you to the controls over there. <coughs> You're not having a hot flash, are you, Sonia? <laughs> <laughs> Is that working? Sorry. <laughs> trying to be subtle with you. I was, but it just... <laughs> I figure if it's blowing me away, it's probably blowing other people away too. Oh, it's better. Sorry. Right. So with lifestyle, this is um, just a few obvious things. Oh, you probably all know that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the pleasure in life. Avoid <laughs> spicy food, alcohol, caffeine. Shh, too, much cap too much caffeine. <laughs> too much caffeine. Too much caffeine is fine. Oh, a little bit is okay. A little bit of alcohol is fine. <laughs> Don't smoke. Balance nutrition's, nutritious diet. We can go into that a bit later. later. Um, there's some food like soy products and legumes and whole grains um, that can increase your phytoestrogen. You have to eat a lot of soy to <laughs> improve on symptoms. Exercise regularly, which we all do because we're all runners, so that's great. And getting enough sleep. So you've got to prioritize your sleep. Make sure you 
go to bed, sleep enough, and regular sleep hours that can really help with menopausal symptoms. Relaxation, mindfulness is great, and keeping cool. <laughs> so, this is my slide. So, I like to think of treating a patient with lifestyle first before medication. Medication can often have side effects, and um, quite often you don't know what side effects. So, you are what you eat, so we should think about what you're eating. Exercise certainly helps with lots of um, reducing lots of symptoms, improve your well being, you get um, uh, good hormones, um, good dopamine, and uh, makes you happy. Avoiding tobacco and alcohol, any recreational drugs, stress management, sleep well, healthy relationships. So, being in a club, that's great. That helps with. Um, with your symptoms and um, being positive as well. Turns out lots of <coughs> menopausal symptoms, it's all related to inflammation. So I don't think this talk get talked about a lot in the mainstream um, doctors. So we need to be aware of inflammation. So inflammation can be caused by many things. Um, your diet can cause inflammation. Stress can cause inflammation, pollution, um, stress with anxiety, depression, mood disorders can often increase inflammation, not sleeping well. Um, so leaky gut is quite often related to your diet that increases inflammation and the endotoxins actually can, be can go into your bowel. And... Um, so you, we can actually measure inflammation by blood tests. So there's blood tests called CRP, which doctors don't often measure, but we can measure your inflammation. Quite often if we measure inflammation, um, we can know, we don't know why you have inflammation, but we can look into these things, your diet, your sleep, your lifestyle, if you have too much stress. And improving all those things can quite often improve your symptoms reduce aches and pains, improve on sleep, improve your digestion, improve your bowel health, maybe get more energy and less brain fog, even lose a bit of weight. So I think of inflammation is the modern disease to um, metabolic health and um, we should all think about trying to how to reduce inflammation. So I talk about diet as just eat real food. So we should all eat real food. The problem is the culture is not real food. So there's so much processed foods going on. All the packaged food, the sauces, sugar, it's all processed. And if you look into the bread, the um, quite often the packaged anything, the sauces, the chicken tonight, the salad dressings, even the the vegetable oil, the seed oil, the margarine, they are all processed foods. So if you, quite often I ask a patient, how's your diet? I eat very healthy. And that's almost the standard answer mm -hmm. of most patients that come in to see me. But if you get into the crux of it, I ask them, what do you eat for breakfast? Is there any snacks? Is there any, what do you eat for lunch? Any snacks in between? What do you eat for dinner? A lot of them is... Cereal, muesli bar, sandwich, packaged noodles, and a lot of that is actually processed food and it's not real food. So you would think bread might be real food, but the flour that we have nowadays is actually quite processed. So you've got to think about eating real food. So to me, real food is meat, protein, meat, eggs, chicken, fish, and vegetables, fruit. So that's real food, not anything that comes out of a packet. So diet is very confusing, I admit. So everyone's got their own ideas. There's vegan, <laughs> and then there's um, at the other end of the spectrum, carnivores. Then there's uh, vegetarian, paleo, keto. Hello. So, um, the, quite often with the diet, we find that 
people going on these diets, they will actually improve. What's coming with all of these diets is um, there's not much processed food in it. So once you go from a standard Australian or standard American diet to one of these diets, you actually got rid of a lot of the processed foods and you get better. So I think the common to this, you can go on any of those diets. The main thing is to avoid processed foods. So you've got to know what the processed foods are and eat the real ones. I advocate um, low carb because the carbohydrates quite often can affect your hormones. So we think of the hormones as what raises the blood glucose. There's a hormone called insulin, which we don't talk often enough. Insulin is the hormone that your body produces every time you eat. So there's um, every time you put something in your mouth, and that includes your coffee and tea and uh, sugar and milk. Every time you put something in your mouth, then the insulin has to come and bring it down. So if you use your insulin too often, you can actually overuse your insulin and then the body produces more insulin to bring the glucose down. The more the body produces insulin, the more your insulin doesn't work then you can get insulin resistance and eventually metabolic syndrome and can eventually lead to diabetes. So what happens is the carbohydrates brings the insulin down way high. The protein does that, but not to an extent. The fat, healthy fat, doesn't really bring the insulin in as much. So what we've got to do is we've got to work with not raising your insulin too much. So if you work your insulin too often too much, you get insulin resistant. This is why I, this is what we, what I advocate is a bit of time restricted eating or in, intermittent fasting. So what that means is don't eat too often. Eat less frequent. So there's some coaches or some Older thinking used to say you need to eat six meals a day. You need to have breakfast, lunch and dinner and snacks in between. What happens is you, if you keep eating, you keep working your insulin and eventually you can get insulin resistance. So what you really should do is eat your main meals and avoid the snacks in between. Some people don't realise that the coffee with the sugar and the milk also raises the insulin as well. So if you have breakfast and then lunch, but you have three coffees in between, each time you have a coffee with the milk and the sugar, then that raises your insulin and that can create the insulin response and eventually it can increase your insulin resistance. So ideally, have your coffee with the milk and the tea tacked onto your breakfast and then you can have that as the meal. So three meals a day or even two meals a day, eat less frequent, have a bit of fasting. So this fasting um, after dinner can actually really help your body metabolism if you have at least 12 hour fasting. So you stop eating at seven o'clock and then you don't eat it until your breakfast until seven o'clock in the morning at least you've got 12 hours fasting that really lets your body to reduce the insulin and the body can have a time to burn off some fat get rid of all the yucky stuff that your body um, produces and the bowel can actually rest and it's actually really good for your body to do this intermittent fasting i also say you don't have to do an extended fast every day, but some people skip your breakfast, have a, have a brunch a little bit later, like 10, 11 o'clock. So you've got an extended fast from let's say seven o'clock the night before to 10 o'clock the next morning. And you've got about 15, 16 hours of fasting. That's actually really beneficial for your body to rest. You don't have to do it every day, maybe um, a couple of times a week, and that's um, fantastic. 
Some people even do 24 hour fast. So eat at dinner, don't eat until the next day dinner. And that's fantastic as well. Even with the recovery of COVID, some of this intermittent fasting can actually help to help your body to heal and recover with recovering of a viral infection. This is what I advocate is low carb real food. If you want to learn a bit more, then um, Peter Bruckner wrote this book on a fat lot of good and it's a good way to start. I usually say eat mostly green fruits. The amber orange fruit is not too bad, not as good, but the red fruit stay away from them. So with, with eating this way, you can really reduce your inflammation, reduce the insulin, and quite often it can improve your, um, lose some weight, improve brain fog, you don't get as hungry, you can still have lots of energy, even with running. So um, you don't have to eat the carbs to do running. So this um, just... Um, this is from my group called Low Carb Melbourne. I actually um, am part of an admin, admin group of Low Carb Melbourne. Um, I ask people what they've found with eating low carb and menopause. So a lot of people say they have less, less brain fog, less vertigo, night sweats, insomnia, they sleep better, they have less joint inflammation, they lost weight, eight kilos, and they sleep well, play sports, and have more energy. So that's from Debbie. Linda said she did, did low carb, hardly any menopausal symptoms at all. Louise says she's perimenopausal and exercising, low carb, fasting, all helping to mitigate weight gain. And Linda, as um, my experience is that the combination of low carb eating, daily exercise, plus fasting, eliminates all menopausal symptoms. If I remove any of these elements, symptoms return, particularly in hot flushes. Exercise doesn't have to be extreme. Fast walking or yoga can work. So let's. So you're all thinking that we carb load. We have to run. We need carbs for exercise. We, <laughs> how do we exercise with without the carbs? And then we exercise. Why can't we eat the donuts after the exercise? <laughs> and then we get the slurpee after the exercise. So. You don't have to have the carbs. So carbs is not an essential macronutrient. So what happens is if you switch your body to burn fat, you can actually burn your own fat. You don't rely on the carbs that you eat. You don't have to carb load. You eat a low carb diet and it can take a week or two or up to a month and you actually can switch your body to be burning fat, you can go from like a car running petrol to running diesel. This diesel can last you much longer. You don't have to fill your body with gels and um, glucose melanas all the time. And you can actually go for longer. You don't hit the wall. You don't have to keep taking the gel, but you will have a period of washout period. So it can take you up to a few weeks of poorer exercise performance. So you have to expect that and you have to have more salt in your food because the low carb food, there's not much salt in it. The salt is in the carbs. So if we stop eating the carbs, then we have to add an extra salt, eat meat and veggies. You don't even have to carb load for a long run. You can don't you don't, you don't have to feel hungry when you're feeling when you're going on the long run, and um, you can learn to fuel your body with your own fat, and you can burn your own fat. You can actually start running exercise and burn your fat. But what happens if you eat the carbs? Is you only burn the the, the, the glucose that you're eating, and you're not burning your own fat. So, no, that um, you don't have to have carbs for running and exercise. So that's my bit about nutrition. So that's about low carb, which I advocate. But even if you don't do low carb, even if you go get rid of the processed food, get rid of sugar, even get rid of 
some of the grains and bread, legumes and lentils, your food, even if you don't go very low carb, you will feel the benefit of more energy um, and um, less menopausal symptoms. So exercise is not just uh, not just running. So you, we should think about exercise as improving your bone health, improving your muscle health, reducing the risk of sarcopenia. So <coughs> sarcopenia is losing muscles. What happens is when you go through menopause, quite often if you run too much and you don't eat enough protein and you don't do strength training, the muscles go wasting. The m running is actually quite a catabolic activity. It burns your muscles. It doesn't build muscle, unfortunately. The longer you run, it doesn't build bone health. So it's about, so if you go for a 10 minute run, or even if you go for a long run for an hour and a half, that hour and a half doesn't build your bones for, for much, for five times the 10 minutes run. So you've got to stimulate your bone. So um, pyelometrics, box jumps, um, lunges, those things can stimulate the bone and that's weight bearing exercise that can improve your bone health. Um, so muscle health, the running doesn't help with the muscles, unfortunately. You've got to do strength training. So you've got to build your muscle with increasing load with, with weights. That helps with increasing muscle strength and building up muscles. So exercise is certainly fantastic and um, it can improve your mental health. They, they recommend 150 minutes a week. I'm sure a lot of you do much more than that. And um, so we should think about running strength training, and even yoga, Pilates can all help. So the difference with going into menopause with running and exercise is we need to not just run, we need to look after our recovery. We need to make sure we rest, because if we don't rest, the muscles don't grow, they don't help, doesn't recover, and it doesn't progress. So we need to prioritise our recovery. We can't run all the time. I personally run four times a week. I do strength training two times a week and one strict day of resting. So no exercise. Sometimes I do a bit of yoga on a rest day. And we can't run fast all the time. So make sure you do 80% slow runs and 20% hard because what happens is the more fast run that you run, you increase your inflammation. So that's actually stress on your body, stress on your bones. So I've taken up running coach. The coach makes me run very, very slow. There's some training programs that actually make you look at your heart rate and run almost to a fast walking pace. So make sure 80% of your run are very slow to your standard and 20% of the hard runs can be intervals and um, sprints or your park run if you go very fast. And make sure you do resistance training, strength training, build up on your load, that can build muscle and um, high intensity interval training can be, can be fantastic. Prioritize your protein intake. If you do all the running, do all the strength training, you don't eat enough protein, then your muscles go wasting. So I usually say every meal, three times a day or two times a day. So if you eat two times a day, you've got to have more protein. So I eat three eggs almost every single morning for breakfast. And I eat a big protein, big steak for dinner. And then I left my lunch as a leftover, so another big steak or chicken or fish or if you're a vegetarian, lentils, tofu, peanut butter, um, prioritise your protein because we're runners. We want to build muscle, not just losing muscle. If you keep running, a lot of the, you can see the runners that doesn't eat enough protein, they're actually quite small muscles. So that's about exercise. We, so that's, um, we know we need to do cardio as well as, well as the strength training.
with menopausal symptoms, we need to prioritize our sleep. So sleeping well reduces your inflammation. Mm. So consistency is the key. You need a good bedtime routine. Do the brushing teeth, do the um, regular bedtime hours. Make sure you sleep seven to eight hours at night. If you watch TV, scroll on social media for too late, you're gonna suffer the next day because you're not having enough sleep. Time restricted eating can also help with sleeping. So time restricted eating means breakfast, lunch and dinner. Avoid anything three hours after your dinner. So your midnight snacks and even alcohol in the evening. That doesn't rest your bowel or your chocolate as an evening snack. Doesn't help your bowel to rest and digest. Mm -hmm. So, um, so improving sleep, you can do that by time restricted eating, avoid snacking, do some intermittent fasting can help with your sleep, melatonin, going outside, doing your exercise outside into the sun, can actually help with mel melatonin at night. So a, little, a lot of people don't realize that sunlight can help the nighttime melatonin. Can I just ask, is that why if you have a vitamin D deficiency, you can often have issues with this sleeping as well? Absolutely, yes. I actually recommend everyone to take vitamin D. Mm -hmm. There's no, not much sun, especially in winter. A lot of people are lacking in vitamin D. The thing with vitamin D is um, the more fat you have, the more vitamin D you need to dissolve it. Vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. So if you have a lot of fat, you need a lot of more vitamin D to dissolve into, into your body storage. So a lot of people are lacking in it. Melbourne, there's no sun. Vitamin D is also in animal foods. So meat, eggs, chicken, fish. You need to take the vitamin D supplement with your healthy fat with your animal food, ideally. So um, then we talk about stress management can reduce inflammation. So what we're trying to do is reduce the aches and pains, reduce inflammation, reduce the menopausal symptoms, improve on sleep, and stress management is another thing. So practicing self-compassion. So if you have a dodgy run, don't beat yourself up. Don't be too harsh on yourself. <laughs> the bad runs are just a reflection of the good runs, so be nice to yourself. I talk about low-carb eating. If you eat a bit of nasty food, naughty food, don't beat yourself up. It doesn't matter. Get back on track the next day. Self-compassion is also think about the foods that you eat. Is it kind to yourself to be eating this food? Is it helpful to your goals? So if you want to be healthy and lose fat and fat adapted to be running on fat and burn your own fat. Before you eat that donut or get that slushy, you can think about, is that helpful? Is it self-compassion? Are you being nice to yourself by eating that donut? So um, my friend Tracy McBeath um, talks a lot about self-compassion. You can go to her website and you can look at her book on uh, self-compassion and uh, you can follow the link on my website to Tracy McBeath's website and her Insta. She talks a lot about self-compassion. That's her, her area. You can join No Cut Melbourne and she's one of the other admins and there's a lot of um, information about self-compassion, looking after yourself, be nice to yourself. Relaxation is very important. So you've got to know about relaxation. It's not about scrolling on social media and non-stop scrolling, mindless scrolling. Certainly I do that too. Um, but um, taking time to get out, doing some deep breathing and going for walks, looking at nature. You don't have to run, you can go for a walk and that is relaxation as well. Meditation, like even five minutes meditation before sleep can help your sleep. Meditation doesn't have to be, you don't have to get your mind blank, it's not about, I a lot of people say, oh I can't do it because I can't get all the thoughts out of my mind. All the thoughts keep coming into my mind. It's about the practice. It's about the, the process of trying to realize this is what's happening to your mind. 
And if the thought comes in, that's fine. You admit it and then you practice getting out that thought and listen to your breathing again. So it's not tough on yourself. Everyone can practice meditation. It's not about perfect. Hypnosis, yoga. So you, I just put on a yoga from YouTube and then half an hour, 20 minutes. Do a bit of yoga, stretching, that's great. And do some deep breathing exercises. And that's great for recovery, reduce inflammation. So I like this slide because the inflammation and insulin and then the lipids, it's all intertwined. Even if we do a lot of exercise, even if we do running, if we don't look after our diet, if we're stressed, if we're not looking after our rest, if we don't sleep enough, you can still be very inflamed and you can run into the risk of obesity, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease. So, sure, we're all runners, but I think we should still look at all the lifestyle and the diet, exercise. Certainly, alcohol smoking isn't recommended. So, alcohol in moderation, you need to look at your goal. If you're trying to lose weight, then you can think about the type of alcohol that you drink and certainly reducing because it's all liquid calories. It doesn't help with weight loss or and doesn't help with running a lot. So coffee is another contentious. I usually say one or two coffees is okay. The more coffees you drink, the more inflammation you get. <coughs> you get rates of cortisol. You can get stressed out with too many coffees raises your heart rate, heart rate. Your body actually produces a lot of cortisol to combat that coffee, too many coffees. So one or two coffees is enough, is my opinion. So Kate, Kate sharing. Kate is, um, I thought I'll share her story because she's um, menopausal. She said she had hysterectomy um, 15 years ago. So she doesn't know what's happening with her period. She doesn't know if her period is menopausal because her periods, we can't tell. She had some menopausal symptoms um, about three to four years ago. Hot flushes, anxiety, anger. Nighttime, she had leg cramps. She used to wake up ten times to go for a walk to, walk, to relieve her leg cramps. So pretty poor sleep. So um, she started doing 5-2 diet and she lost 18 kilos, but eventually the weight crept back on. But then she discovered low carb because she's a friend on my social media and I keep posting low carb. And um, she followed low carb and she lost 8 kilos. Her um, running got better. So um, these are her photos. She say this is all part of the journey. So the first photo is the first part of her journey. Then the next is still, it's not a before after, it's during the first part of the journey, during the second part of the journey, during the third part of the journey, and she's still on a journey, she's still on the discovery of how her body goes and discovering about her, herself, her eating, managing sleep, she changed her jobs and that helps to reduce her stress and um, her menopausal symptoms have improved. She said she has less hot flushes, her mood improved, she has less anxiety, she said she felt less angry and she can run a half marathon faster, only carrying electrolytes and she had a 13 minute PB on the half marathon. So fantastic. Electrolytes, are you just talking salt? Just salt. So no sugar drink. So quite a few low carb runners. It's just we just carry electrolytes. So we have, um, I have an electrolyte before I run, and then I carry electrolyte during my longer runs. I my rule is over fifteen kilometers, I carry a vest and carry electrolytes. But shorter than fifteen kilometers, I don't worry about it. Do you make the electrolytes yourself? No, I buy, I buy a brand. Yeah. There's plenty on the market um, that are actually not full of sugar. Um, you just got to look around. I can recommend a few. Yeah, I can recommend some too. The ones they have on course at Melbourne Marathon and those sorts of events are low 
That's my, just yes, me. That's you, yeah. Um, at what ultra distance would you say, okay, that's too far to go <coughs> only red light? So mm. if you have an upper limit where you then have to take something, and if you do take them something beyond that distance, what do you think you need? Uh, I did another marathon without any food last year. I carried electrolytes. <coughs> yeah, same. But I guess I did without, when I did non marathon. If I do need anything, I'll have peanut butter or something like that, like a little squirty thing for peanut butter. So there are quite a number of us who are like ultra distance runners. So you're talking um, six hours plus, yeah. six, 12, 20 yeah, hours. Sure. Um, and at what point then would you... You have to look for what works for you. Yeah. So during a race, it's probably in the, you can have some gels during a race, but the majority of the training, if you train low carb fasted, you can learn to use your body fat as the fuel. What if you don't have a lot of body fat to fuel? Then you still, so I'm 16% body fat. Mm. You've still got a lot of fat to fuel. But you even over run those out, ultra distances? You won't run out of fat mm. to fuel. You can fuel your with fat if you want to go long ultra and you want to fuel with fat, you can have peanut butter, you can have dark chocolate, you can have beef jerkies. Avocado. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I always, thought, I always thought hitting the wall was when your body had to swap from carbs well, to fats and that's why you hit the wall and yes. that's why you have the carb load. I don't understand, like, yeah, I don't understand yeah, how we have no carbs, like how it doesn't when you hit the wall. Run out of glycogen yeah. is the issue. But you're not running on glycogen. Glycogen is the carbs that you yeah. eat. So it's a, it's a sugar that's stored in your, in your liver. Mm -hmm. But because over training, you learn to use your body fat to burn fat. So you're burning on the fat rather than the glycogen. And there was a big difference for me running half marathon. Mm -hmm. Using carb loading and then converting to not using carbs because I didn't hit the wall. It takes a period of conversion, it so it takes long time, yeah. it takes a few weeks to up to a couple of months mm -hmm. to shift that um, that fueling system, and you actually feel like you can keep going when you're fat adapted. You don't get hungry. <laughs> There's also a number of theories around. Um, on that hitting the wall is actually not about your fuel and your glycogen, but it's actually what to do with your hydration. And it's got a lot mm -hmm. to do with it because basically what they're now saying, um, and Dr. Stacey Sims is a really good one to read up on, is that plain water isn't enough, mm -hmm. but sugary drinks like Tailwind, etc., are not right either because they're pulling the water out of your small mm -hmm. intestine to actually process them. So you need to be, as Arby said, those low carb electrolytes, and there are a few on the market there. They're harder to find than you think, but once you, you work out, you know, which ones hit the, the right markers, they actually do make a difference um, and stop that, you know, that feeling, that feeling that you get when just everything's going in your head and you're like, oh. um, But it's really, I think it's a, everything's a trial and error, yeah. right? Yeah. And you've got to work out what works for you in the yeah. long run. There's some runners that train low, train with low carb, and then when they race, they do some carbs so they can switch fueling systems. So some carbs when they're racing. So um, so that's all about the um, nutrition and the um, bit of it about Kate. Um, so menopause, you've got to think of it's not just menopause. There's a lot of other things. So make sure you do get a check up with your doctor. Insulin resistance. So when you go through menopause, it might not be menopause. It might be insulin resistance that's causing a lot of your aches and pain symptoms. So quite often when I see patients try to reduce their insulin 
that joint aches and pains actually get better. And it's not really menopause that's causing it. So thyroid disorders, get a blood test, iron deficiency. A lot of people don't eat enough red meat. Then they get iron deficient. They get tired, they get moody because of the iron, not because of menopause. Then there's anxiety, depression, mood disorders, medication side effects, food intolerances. Some people have, um, they can get, um, well, in, uh, metabolic syndrome is the food intolerance. They can't digest the carbs. That's why it's insulin resistance. Some people are histamine intolerance. So high histamine foods can make them become hot flushes and they can get the allergic symptoms from high histamine foods. What's a high histamine food? Highly processed foods. So um, uh, packaged anything, um, even uh, processed meat, anything that's lasting longer that's got high histamine, so releases histamine, it's an, like an allergic reaction. Then there's, um, you can Google high histamine food and you can get a complete food, uh, food list. Or I can send you some if you like. Um, make sure you do all the cervical screening, breast checks, mammograms, blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, bone density, avoid smoking and alcohol, look after your mental health. Um, we, am I going too slow? No, you're fine. <laughs> Um, then there's, uh, if you do, I do see some people that are perfect lifestyle, nothing I can um, improve. Then we can think about menopause hormone therapy. Again, we're not using HRT because there's a scare a few years ago with the Women's Health Initiative. That scare, a lot of GPs don't want to prescribe anymore with HRT because that study is actually done on a lot of older women. And those women, quite often, they're more overweight. A lot of them are smokers, and they have high chance of cardiovascular disease and uh, strokes. So that trial have um, stopped a lot of the doctors prescribing hormones. But um, the newer hormones are more bioidentical. They're not horse hormones. That the older hormones are made of horse urine. So these hormones, the topical. <laughs> yeah, <horse neuron. laughs> so these hormones in the form of a cream or a patch is um, or pessary is um, quite safe. There's the studies done on the perimenopausal younger 50 age group around those age group hasn't increased the risk of cardiovascular disease and dementia and strokes or Alzheimer's disease. So um, we can think about Hormone replaced or uh, menopausal hormone therapy in the lowest safest dose for symptomatic treatment. Whereas 20 years ago, in my mum's age, they used to give HRT to every woman. So you need to be careful. These women aren't suitable for NHTs, those with blood clots, blood, uh, breast cancers, and gallstones, they're not safe with the NHT. Um, you can still use vaginal estrogen, so in the form of pessary or a cream, it's very, very little that's absorbed into the vagina. Um, that's usually very beneficial for dry vagina symptoms and painful sex. And then there's uh, NHT is not recommended for um, liver disease and treated blood pressure in those at risk of clotting. Then there's non-hormone options. Um, some GPs don't like hormones, a lot of GPs stay away from hormones and I've just started to, because um, I want to look into more, women do need hormones, so I've started to prescribe the NHT, but then there's um, other doctors do antidepressants, blood pressure medications, epilepsy medications can certainly help with symptoms if you don't want to go through hormones. Uh, again about vaginal dryness, lubricants, estrogen, Menopause hormone therapy can certainly help with vagina dryness. Then there's the natural, other natural stuff. CBT is just just talking to yourself about trying to accept this is normal and talk to yourself about um, realising, don't worry about it, hot flushes, it'll go away. Acupuncture, hypnotherapy, traditional Chinese medicine, some herbs like black cohosh. Um, you can get remifenin and uh, Promensal, that's uh, their two black cohosh 
brands and there is some symptomatic relief with hot flushes. Phytoestrogens, that's the soy products. So tofu, you have, but you have to eat a lot of it. Um, then there's a uh, pharmacy compounded hormones, far identical hormones. Gene health, this site belongs to Gene health, they don't recommend it because they are worried that it's not safe and there's no control over the production and prescribing and the dosing. Um, menopause and sex, it can affect your libido. In that case, there are topical testosterone you can think about. So doctors, some doctors can prescribe testosterone creams in the form of, um, to help with libido. But that's a, a different hormone to estrogen. Painful sex, vaginal lubricants, menopause hormone therapy, relaxation, pelvic floor, physique or a psychologist, sex therapist. The idea with contraception is um, we still recommend contraception. You can still fall pregnant and then sometimes you release an egg, even if your period goes all over the place. You can still release an egg, so you don't want to fall pregnant and have a baby when you're, you've got teenagers or two-year-old kids. <laughs> so we still recommend thinking about contraception until you're 50. So condoms, or um, you can still stay on the pill, and then there's Marina, there's other things that you can think about. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got to still think about health after menopause, so that's another... So if you're menopause 50, you've got another 50 years. So that's the, uh, the next half of your life. So you've got to maintain good health, look after your heart health, osteoporosis, um, avoid weight gain, prevent type 2 diabetes. A third... Those things are more likely after menopause, aren't they? Osteoporosis. Correct. It's harder to control weight. Yes. Yeah. But all that is insulin resistance. It's all insulin resistance. Correct. So you've got higher chance after menopause. If when you go through menopause, estrogen goes down. Yeah. The less estrogen you get, the higher chance of insulin resistance. Yeah. So that's why inflammation reduces. <laughs> so menopause doesn't cause weight gain. It changes your body shape. But I think it's insulin resistance. So, so have a healthy diet, exercise. Keep a healthy weight, don't smoke, reduce alcohol, check blood pressure, go to your doctor's survival screening, breast screen, bowel screen, and when to see your doctor? Leading after menopause. So if you've gone through menopause, no periods after 12 months, that's defined as menopause. If you bleed, that uh, needs investigation, so that's a worry. Usually I would send you to a gynecologist and need a curette to check and make sure it's not anything serious. Urinary incontinence can be quite troublesome, so pelvic floor physio and even um, a urogynecologist can be helpful about incontinence. So that's from Gene Hales. They do lots of resources. And that's my contact if, you're, if you want to get in touch with me or follow me on socials. You can join Low Carb Melbourne if you're keen to learn about Low Carb.